All right. We are so excited to talk to Professor Snow today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, throughout the episode, I just got confirmation. I can call him Rod. Um, but he said that's okay. Um, but we have Professor Rod or Rodney Snow. Um, if you've seen his, I'm sure you have, because he's published a lot of um, pieces of literature out there, but he is with us today. And as our guests know, we're not going to let them know too much about you just yet, um, because we're going to dive straight into our two truths and a lie. Um, how's your day going? It's just getting started over there, right? Is it just getting started? I've just um, packed up my little grandson and sent, <laughs> sent him off home. Uh, so it's been a little bit busy, actually, but it's a nice day. Um, oh, well, it's only 10 degrees over here. so uh, Celsius. <laughs> middle, middle of winter. So oh, Okay. Um, Oh, man, but, uh, things are going well. Awesome. Um, it's 9 a.m. for our listeners um, for Rod over there in Australia. So, um, but our time zones work out great. So he's he's awake. It's daylight. I'm awake. It's daylight. So this is all good. Um, so why don't we dive in, Rod? What are your two truths and a lie? Okay. Um, right, let's go. So number one would be I've completed a thousand kilometer walk. Oh, wow. Okay. Another one would be. I have a golf handicap of 11. Okay. And another one is that I worked as a visiting scientist in Canada. Wait, say the last one one more time. A visiting scientist in Canada. Oh, okay. Um, man. And you said the second one was a golfing situation? Yeah. Handicap of 11. Oh man, I have no, I know nothing about golfing, so that could totally be a, a truth or a lie. I have no idea. I am not a golfer. Um, uh, we need to catch up. Yeah, what do you think, Amanda? I'm gonna go. I they all could be true. I feel like uh, yeah. I'll go with the visiting scientists in Canada. Maybe it was like you were in the U S or something. Mm, okay, okay, a little play on the um, words. I'm going to go with the golfing one because I have no idea about golfing, So, but don't tell us the answer yet. Um, we will reveal it to the listeners at the end, um, but now we can get a little bit of background on you. We might reveal some of the, the truths or lies through, through a little bit of your background, but tell us how did you get into this field of research and what kind of drew you to this specific area? Like, how come you were so passionate about it? How did you get here? Yeah, it was a long time ago. So um, back in the 1980s, I was a, uh, a physical education student mm. and I was going to go around and be a teacher. But once I went to university, I worked out there was a lot of uh, a lot of other things that I wasn't exposed to and I was excited about the human body. I really liked um, you know, how, the, you know, how the human body adapted to, to exercise and so that really turned me on and I was good at it. So then I said, okay, well, Instead of being a physical education teacher, I went on to do a master's degree. And um, then I went on to do a PhD. But the other thing about it was in the, back in the 1980s in Australia, at least, um, there wasn't a lot of um, sports science going on. It was just starting to grow. And there, was, um, there wasn't really a lot of opportunity to do research. So I was one of the first group of academics in the exercise science space. Um, so um, wow. to, to get going. So there was, and it's exciting. So we actually started up a whole whole lab and started off doing a lot of lot of work in, we a lot of work in, we've done a lot of work in heat, a lot of work mm. in um, um, supplements. Yeah. Um, and um, the, other, the other part about it also like um, working with bright young individuals who were, you know, really motivated and um, also share the passion. Amazing. And the final bit for me was, would be that just, um, just learning um it's really you get a wow factor when, when you've actually discovered something which is the first time someone in the world has seen it you've seen it first and you go oh wow that's that's interesting so that's a good fun but they're the good they're the good parts about research yeah <laughs> that's very exciting what is um something talking about something you've discovered before anybody else in the world what what was what or what is one of those things that happened in your career oh okay Any, a few times. too many to count <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, just recently, okay, because I've, I've also I, I delved in exercise science and also I've got a branch now in the reproductive science. Oh, I saw some of that literature, yeah. yes. Um, and that happened by chance because I, I, I was 
I've, I've done a lot of work in career team, career team mm-hmm. in, in the sports science space. Wow. And then I had a, a professor from uh, my local university near me knock on my door and said, what happens if you creatine supplemented a mother mm. and that got into the and crossed and crossed the placenta and, and got into the baby and loaded them loaded the baby up? Yeah. Would it protect yeah. the baby from a hypoxic shock? You know, so during oh. birth, blood tied around the neck, something like that. So that kind of stuff. Anyway, so I've been into reproductive science. So the, we've now we've just done some experiments on the human uterus mm. and shown that the uterus itself can actually um, Synthesize creatine and cool. release creatine, etc. So that there's a first. Amazing. So that 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 kind of work is, you know, you know um, wow, it's, it's fun, really fun. Fascinating. Fun. The the uterus can synthesize creatine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what? And so fascinating. So what do you What's think? The, yeah, what is it doing <laughs> that for? <laughs> do we that know form, why yeah. it's doing that? No, um, but we have some um, hypotheses. One is um, it's potential, it's potential, and it, it actually changes during the menstrual cycle as well. So ah. just prior to ovula- ovulation, it, its synthesis capacity increases. Mm. One of the possibilities is that that, that um, creatine is then secreted into the uterine fluid. Hmm. And it is known that um, sperm is activated in a high creatine concentrated concentration of the fluid. Interesting. So potentially, potentially helps with fertilization. So wow. it activates the sperm, gives it a, a greater chance to reach the ovum and fertilize it. So wow. there's, there's a possibility. Um, huh. The other possibility is also as obviously preparing the uterus for embedding of the blastocyst. Mm-hmm. So that's an energy rich environment. So when the blastocyst embeds, it's probably, it helps provide energy to that particular um, blastocyst that continues to develop. Wow. So they're, uh, they're, the, they're the things we're starting to, to work so on. So interesting. Uh, so, so does that make you want to test or have um, participants consume creatine supplementation to mm-hmm. potentially increase chances of maybe fertilizing? I, I'm, yeah, correct. Yeah. It's one of the experiments we've been discussing and, and, des- and deciding on now. One of, one of the possibilities, is especially with male, um, with males, infertile males, is it mm. a greater in, in, um, supplementation of males mm-hmm. could help the, help their fertilization get more oh. active sperm? Mm-hmm. That's one possibility. The other possibility, obviously, is the other way around you know, mm-hmm. um, to help fertilization with the female. So there, there, there's some of the work that we're starting to, starting to do. And that all, that all grew from creatine supplementation. Yeah. Know, wow that's incredible yeah the stuff you find out right i mean yeah yeah, interesting what was kind of circling back to that initial study you were talking about with um uh pregnant mothers supplementing with creatine what was was there an outcome that you guys discovered from that okay um so the problem with that that's where we were where we're going yeah oh okay we weren't getting we haven't got to the we are starting to work with the mothers now. But, gotcha. Um, one has to be sensitive during pregnancy, obviously. Yes. To make sure they're not going to um, influence anything or have any detrimental effects. The, the answer is it shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've done a lot of animal model work with, mm. with mice, etc., mm-hmm. And that's shown to actually protect the fetus. Um, wow. In a hypoxic state. So mm-hmm. um, we can actually increase survival rate by 40%. Interesting. Wow. If, you um, put the put the fetus in a in a anoxic state. We can wow. keep them alive for longer. So basically, the really... creatine gets into the brain. Yeah, and acts as, acts as an, it helps with an en- as an energy source, an anaerobic energy source. Hmm. That's really up. fascinating. So okay, so this makes me think. This is so you were talking about hypoxic, and it makes me think mm-hmm. of like high altitude. Has there been anything done with creatine in high altitude? Uh, not that I know of. No, it's an interesting. Well, in theory, it it, it should help. Yeah, in because, theory, yeah. this makes me think about that. Interesting. Yeah, um, no, I haven't come across any 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 work in altitude. Yeah. I've seen it in. Um, they've done it in uh, chambers, hypoxic chambers. There's a group in New Zealand who have a 
they they uh, put individuals um, uh, with half the normal oxygen levels, mm-hmm. and they loaded the individuals up with creatine, mm. and they did all this all sorts of uh, they, they did um, some scanning of the brain, but they also did some uh, cognitive tests, mm. and they found that the individuals who were loaded with creatine had a better maintenance of their cognition than those who didn't in that hypoxic environment. Yeah. So in that, in that condition, which is obviously simulating altitude, mm-hmm. um, it, it has a positive effect. So the answer is wow. it's likely to, yes. Yeah, very neat, very neat. <laughs> I mean, so I love speaking to people like yourself. That I mean, goodness, it's like, it's like, I'd love it. <laughs> I get to learn all these new fun. things. Yeah. yeah. Um, you have so much knowledge up there. It's, it's incredible. Um, but big topic I wanted to hit on with you today. All this stuff is absolutely f- fascinating. I'm sure we could do a whole podcast on the female re- reproductive side of things, but I wanted to dive into t- to today, um, conversations around sodium bicarb. Cause I know you've done a little, some, well, a little, a lot of research there and, um, Part of the reason why I wanted to dive into that with you today was I get, I'm getting a lot of questions about it from my athletes, but the literature, the literature I have seen says like a pretty large variation in terms of peak in, in blood, um, like the time range can be very different between individuals. And that's something I kind of wanted to, to talk a little bit, um, to you about today, but before we, we dive down that rabbit hole, um, I wanted to just have you kind of give us a breakdown of what, what is sodium bicarbon and, and how is it working in the body? If someone is supplementing with it. Okay. Um, sodium bicarb, these simple uh, molecule, it's basically you find it in your, in your, in your kitchen cupboard, most, People have it in their kitchen cabinets, bake, call it baking soda or bicarbonate soda. Mm-hmm. I'm mean, using cooking and you know, rising the cakes and all that kind of stuff. Not that I'm a great cook, but it, you find it in cooking. Basically, it's a, a, it's a, it's a white compound kind of powder. Um, it's actually formally called sodium bicarbonate, which is sodium and HCO3. Mm-hmm. So it's the bicarbonate ion, so it's the sodium ion and the bicarbonate ion. Um, and the way it works in the body is. Bicarbonate is the major extracellular buffer. And what I mean by buffer is it actually um, controls the hydrogen ion concentration. It'll either soak up the hydrogen ion, take it out of solution, or or will release the hydrogen ion. So it's controlling um, extracellular pH. Mm -hmm. Now, pH in biological fluids or in biological organisms, pH has to be controlled because there's a, uh, a range in which the pH can be in above or below that range, um, the, the cells can't survive. Mm. It's essentially, it essentially affects the proteins and the shape and the activity of the proteins within cells. So it has to be kept within a, a narrow range and the body has many, many mechanisms to make sure it is controlled in a, in a narrow range. Mm. So one of these is, is bicarbonate concentration in the blood. And the way it seems to work is that um, if you ingest bicarbonate, it'll increase the bicarbonate concentration in the blood, and therefore you're increasing the buffering capacity in the blood, and therefore what what will happen then is the hydrogen ions will bind to bicarbonate and come out of solution. So your pH of the blood will rise. It'll become alkalotic. It'll Mm. rise. Now, it doesn't, at rest, it doesn't do much to what happens inside the cell. So inside the muscle cells, but Mm -hmm. during intense activity, the muscle cells will produce acid, lactic acid, Mm -hmm. anaerobic glycolysis, if you're doing intense activity. And what what, um, increasing the pH in the blood does is it maintains a a concentration gradient. So it's easier for the hydrogen ions to diffuse out of the muscle into Mm -hmm. the blood, Mm -hmm. and then it gets soaked up in the blood by the bicarbonate, just taking those hydrogens out. Hmm. So it increases the release of hydrogen ions and lactate from the muscle. So it's keeping the lactate and hydrogen ion concentration in the muscle lower for longer. Now, this is where the next bit bit is that hydrogen ions are thought to be related to um, 
a high concentration of hydrogen ions is thought to be related to fatigue. Mm. So muscle um, produces um, less power. Now, how it does that is um, open to debate. There are two probable possibilities. One, it lowers, it slows the rate in which the muscle can contract. Mm. So we're slowing cross bridge cycling. So therefore, the rate at which you're contracting is slower. So the power that the muscle produces is less. Mm. The other thing it does, it, it also can you know, a high hydrogen concentration can inhibit um, energy supply to the muscle by inhibiting glycolysis. Mm. So you're getting less less energy to the muscle, less ATP, less fuel, mm -hmm. muscle fatigues. So bicarbonate works by keeping the pH of the muscle lower for longer. Therefore, the fatiguing characteristics are reduced and therefore you can do more work produce more power okay nice. so kind of in 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 my second grade second grader yeah. terms um someone could sustain a sim like a, a similar similar harder output for longer when utilizing the bicarb because of that buffering effect and with that, though, becomes, I guess, a little bit of the tricky part is talking about the timing of peaking. How does that translate when someone's consuming it? If I guess the kind of big question is if we don't know when it's peaking because we don't we're not in a lab and we're not testing blood. Yeah. Um, is that something where someone's getting a benefit as it's slowly peaking when they're pushing their efforts over that duration, or are they wanting to time it so they push those efforts when it's peaking? Yeah. Well, okay. Um, the ideal would be to time the exercise when the blood alkalosis is peaked. Gotcha. That's that's the ideal. The good news is that. Um, the peak, when it peaks, is, is a bit of a broad range of time, mm -hmm. which is probably not, um, you know, it might be slightly down on the peak or it might be on either side of the peak, but it's up for a, a fair while. Mm -hmm. And whether it's, you know, a little bit up or a little bit down on the peak probably doesn't matter. The literature would say, and then this is, again, another debate, that you need to get the alkalosis, the, the blood alkalosis up by um, so the blood bicarbonate concentration up by four to six units, mm. um, and once you get it above, you know some say six and above. Mm -hmm. There's some literature that four and above is enough. Mm. If you can get it above four, um, you will get your ergogenic effects. <laughs> now, but being above four, if we're going to take four as the bottom line, mm -hmm. it's actually up above four for a certain, you know, a reasonable period of time, like 30 to 60 minutes. Wow. Okay. But it's a reasonable period of time. It's not just going back up and back rapidly. Yeah. So it's up there above four for a period of time. Hmm. And, you know, it's obviously if you take six as your, as your threshold, it's up it's up, up, up above six for a lesser time. Mm -hmm. It's going up and down. Right. But it's still a reasonable period of time. So if you don't have the capacity to um, take, you know, take blood and, and measure the degree of alkalosis, you can probably be um, reasonably confident that if you take the take the dose and wait at least an hour, mm -hmm. but maybe 90, 90 minutes to 180 minutes, so it's mm -hmm. an hour and a half to three mm -hmm. hours, in that period of time, you will have your the blood um, Alkalosis will be sufficient enough for you to do um, ergogenic effects. Hmm. Okay. So you don't have to, you know, it, it it's not that precise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't have to worry. Okay. But, yeah. Interesting. And so then the, this leads me to dosing amount. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yep. And the dosing amount is a lot of, there's a fair amount of literature on dosing amount. Mm -hmm. the, most of the literature would indicate that the optimum amount is about um, 0.3 grams per kilogram body weight. Okay. So if you're, if you're a 70 kilogram individual, it would be mm. 21 grams of mm. 
sodium bicarbonate. The effective dose can go from about um, 0.2, so 0.3 is about the optimum, 0.2 is on the lower range, and people have taken narrowback between 0.4 and 0.5. Mm. The issue becomes you get less, you know, the ergogenic effects might be slightly better with 0.4 and 0.5, but only slightly, but you then start to risk um, the side effects, which can have negative effects on, on the right. potential. So the balance is probably between side effects and ergogenic effects is around about 0.3. Okay. Per kilogram body weight. So it's kind of the sweet spot. So talking about the side effects, I know that was one of the pieces of literature we came across where we were like, we need to talk to this guy, (laughs) Um, where you were comparing sodium bicarb versus sodium citrate. um, And the, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was, I think it was 300 milligrams per kilo and then 500 milligrams per kilo. Is that right? Um, And and um, looking at the, the gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, so can you kind of let our listeners know with that dosing amount, the high, that 0.45 or 0.4 um, grams per kilo, what are some of the potential negative side effects that one might experience? <laughs> and this is, this is, this is the, um, I said the catch-all or the issue that has to be addressed by every athlete in this sense. Mm-hmm. You, you, Side effects can be experienced by individuals, certain individuals. Um, mm-hmm. So any athlete who's going to use sodium bicarbonate or sodium citrate probably should do some practicing of this before a major event mm-hmm. because it would be crazy. they'd be crazy to take this um, beforehand because they need to know how they their body responds to yeah. uh, to the to the situation. But um, there are things like, um, well, let me just see, oh, I've got a little list here. It goes on. So, um, you know, nausea, mm-hmm. a bit sick, bloated, mm-hmm. abdominal cramps. Uh, the worst yeah. ones are vomiting and, and diarrhea. Right. So, um, if you don't do the dosing right, mm. you can get these negative effects, and clearly these negative effects are going to impinge upon the subsequent performance. Right, so, yeah. So even, not right, not right, not right. Okay, yeah. so then there, there are ways to dose mm. to, okay. to reduce the possibility. It doesn't eliminate it completely because there are mm-hmm. some people, for whatever reason, um, who are a little bit sensitive to this type of um, approach. Um, so the ways to dose is you actually, the first thing is to actually take, take the dose in, you know, um, over, say, a 15-minute period mm-hmm. in capsules. Okay. Now, it looks like the literature is now starting to indicate that the best capsules to take is, is kind of two types of capsules, gelatin capsules. Okay. And one, another one's called in, enteric capsules. Oh, now, okay. Gelatin capsules, when you – and one of the reasons why you take it is because the taste of um, sodium bicarbonate is not great. Mm-hmm. So it's a salty kind of mm, chalky type of – um, taste so it's not, it's not the best. So to get rid of around palatability and maybe some upper gastrointestinal issues, mm-hmm. if you put it inside the capsule, you don't, the capsules are tasteless. So when you when you swallow them, um, you don't get that that kind of um, salty, chalky kind of taste, and you're, you're pal- it's more palatable. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is. Um, the capsules, if you take the enteric capsules, or oh, so the mm-hmm. gelatin capsules will actually dissolve in the stomach and mm. the contents of what is, what's in those capsules will be released into the stomach. The enteric capsules are, have a polymer coating on mm. them and they're resistant to acid. Um, mm. um, uh, the stomach acids. So they'll actually dissolve, they'll move through the stomach into the small intestine and be released there. Mm. So some of the upper, you know, the, the feeling of, um, you know, burping and abdominal cramps, bloating might not be as big mm. with enteric capsules. And there's a recent study just about to come out, and I, was, I got a notification the other day on it in mid-size sports and exercise, where they've done a comparison between enteric capsules and gelatin capsules. Oh, and cool. the, 
the uh, side effects are less in the enteric capsules. So you take it in the capsules. The other thing to do is to take it with you know, um, a volume of water, usually about mm -hmm. a litre, mm -hmm. three quarters of a litre, um, and maybe a, even a small meal, a small carbohydrate meal. Mm -hmm. All of those things tend to reduce any side effects or, or lower them. Yeah. So it is important to follow a protocol on, on ingesting these things such that you can reduce any side effects or keep them to a minimum and then therefore the impact on, on performance is, is less. So that's yeah, okay. that's great. And so kind of with that too, it makes me one of the questions I wanted to talk to you about talking about all these different ways to consume. Um, are you familiar with the product, Martin? I don't know if <laughs> we're not sponsored by anybody, but um, they created a product where it is, I don't know if they call it enteric coated or not, um, but they basically created like took sodium bicarb, created very tiny, almost like smaller than a grain of rice um, sodium bicarb. And so they deliver when you order the product, you have a, basically a bunch of little, almost like rice size granules of sodium bicarb that you mix into their carb solution. That's kind of gelatinous and then you eat it. Um, and they're saying, you know, these little small capsules, they don't, you don't chew them. So then they, you know, mix with this carb solution and pass through the stomach and should be less GI issues. So I was curious if you had heard anything about that um, and the realisticness of, of that happening. Um, but then there's also products I know that I've seen have sodium bicarb lotions. Have you seen those? No, I tried, I, no, I tried looking that up and I, and I can't see it. But, and the lotions, what, well, the blood of skin, is that what we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, so they're, they're suggesting rubbing on like your legs if you're a cyclist to what are your what's your initial thoughts on that? My thoughts are I, I can't see how the hell they can they can work. Yeah. Because it, it, you know, the tried and true mechanism of how sodium bicarbonate works is to increase the, the bicarbonate concentration of the plasma. The mm -hmm. plasma. The absorption of bicarbonate across the skin, I would have thought, would be almost minimal. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or zero. So if that's the case. It's not getting across into yeah. the body or into the plasma, so it's not doing the job. So I cannot see yeah. how bicarbonate lotions can ever work yeah. as an ergogenic aid for exercise. So yeah. I would be the other one um, sounds a little bit hocus pocus to me in the sense of it, obviously those cap those the way those little pellets that you talked mm -hmm. about probably haven't been um, scientifically. Mm. Scrutinized, mm -hmm. but you know, in the in the olden days, the way that, we, that people were taking sodium bicarbonate was to mix the powder up in a in a solution mm -hmm. and to drink it, mm. which is not much different to the pellet. Obviously, the pellets probably, but you know, um, it's falling apart inside the gut. Right. Obviously, the, the sodium bicarbonate in a solution is already disassociated in the sodium bicarb as, you, as, you, as you're taking it down. But once it, re it reaches the gut, I would have thought that the two responses would be pretty similar between mm -hmm. the drink and the pellets because mm -hmm. as soon as it hit the gut, yeah. um, activities, activity is happening. So um, um, I would have thought the research is starting to become more and stronger and stronger than enteric. Um, mm -hmm. Sodium bicarb capsules is the way to go, or enteric capsules with sodium bicarb are the way to go. Yeah, awesome. And so, with those enteric capsules and that dosing amount, what does that end up like? Is that like thirty capsules, twenty capsules that someone's yeah. consuming? Well, it depends on the size of the person. Doesn't yes, it? yeah. <laughs> uh, typically, on our experiment, if you take a seventy kilogram person, mm. that's like yeah, yeah, physiological norm, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's it's 21 grams okay and okay. that get that goes into about 20 to 30 capsules yeah. oh wow yeah That's, okay so it takes a bit of time so to, to actually ingest it we you know we've done experiments where you um, ingest not not sodium bicarb but sodium citrate mm -hmm. in a 15 minute period over a 30 minute period 45 and a 60 minute period mm. um it makes a little difference it, it um 
there's not a huge amount of difference in that, that kind of period. But you, you're going to have to take these over as a minimum minute, 15 minute period. So you, you know, take a drink, take it down, have a rest, mm -hmm. take it, you know, split, split the dose up, put, put it, you know, over a 15 minute, 20 minute period, you've ingested your, your 30 capsules. And from there, you start your time, you say, okay, I need to be exercising. So for sodium bicarb, um, I would I would say it's ninety minutes to one hundred and eighty minutes is your, mm. when you're going to be okay. So an hour and a half to three hours after. Okay, and <clears throat> talking about that time to peak and different types of athletes, maybe in sport, we have a lot of endurance based athletes listening, but I'm also curious with the effect. So the benefit that it can have that ergogenic effect. Mm. What what type of athletes or sports or even maybe training type of sessions, do you see this being a beneficial tool? Okay. Now, this is very interesting when you talk about the endurance. Okay. Um, the ergogenic aid, sodium bicarbonate, is um, buffering hydrogen mm -hmm. which are produced by um, intensely contracting muscles, so which are you know, producing lactic acid. There's no lactic acid being produced. Mm -hmm. the, the chances of it doing something in, in an event is um, small mm. because it's no buffering going on. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a purely aerobic event, it's st steady state exercise. Mm. There's very little lactic acid being produced. So buffering is not going to do much. Mm -hmm. So where it might be working in an endurance event is maybe at the start, if it's a bit of a, you know, if you're going from rest and you're, you know, you're, going to, you're pushing it, so you do the fast start in an endurance event, hmm. or in the sprint home. In, in between times, it's doing not much at all because yeah. you're in steady state exercise. And there are some studies which have looked at, you know, three hours of cycling exercise and then, um, uh, imitated a sprint home mm -hmm. and shown that the, the sprint home is more power being produced when the mm. bike is loading. So there are some evidence in acute loading mm -hmm. that in an endurance event which has a sprint home, mm. do something. If it's just a cons constant grind and there's no sprint home, it probably won't do anything. Okay. Buffer. Now, most of the literature has been on intense exercise, like um, 200 meter run, mm -hmm. uh, running or 2000 meter rowing. Events which are, there's a lot, a lot of evidence uh, that it works in events which are high intensity from 30 seconds, might be on the low end, but certainly by a minute of high intensity exercise to about 12 minutes mm. of exercise. So you can start picking things like a 2000 meter row is. You know, a six minute or well, five minute exercise. Mm -hmm. 15 had a better run. It's really an exercise. Mm -hmm. Any of those times where you uh, 400 meter race, 800 meter race, those where there's a you know, really high intensity effort and a lot of lactic acid being produced by the muscle, there's an ergogenic effect. Mm. How big is the ergogenic effect? Is the next bit? It's not great. It's not big, but it's significant. It's, it, <laughs> It's about one to three percent improvement. Okay. Now, that one to three percent improvement could be finish on the podium or gold medal. Right. So, but you know, that takes a huge, huge improvements. But it's one to three percent, and it's there's a lot of um, studies. Sodium bicarb has been studied extensively. There's, there's hundreds of papers, and people have done synthesis papers called meta, meta analysis and looked at its ergogenic effects and it's fairly clear in mm -hmm. those type of events so it's absolutely clear in those high intensity events lasting maybe 30 seconds but 60 seconds to 12 minutes lots of evidence on that and then you start picking picking the events which fit inside that and then you away you go the endurance stuff is as i said more controversial yeah. It's, it's, it's the sprints inside the endurance events in which it's having its effect. Mm, mm -hmm. Now, 
there's another set of liturgy, which is now coming out. This is where you might be getting your questions, where um, athletes, endurance athletes, or athlete um, studies have been looking at um, loading of bicarb every day and training. Mm -hmm. And what they've and in, what they've found is that the endurance adaptations have increased significantly Interesting. with the training. So they're going to the training is about like interval work, etc. And is an increased um, uh, you know, reduction in fatigue, um, increase in aerobic capacity, etc. Mm. So that's the endurance component, which has actually been switched. The, the adaption has been switched on. Mm -hmm. to a greater extent huh. when they're doing the training with the bike car. And then obviously, the, so the, the training is, is better. So mm -hmm. when they go to do the performance, presumably it's better. But it's, Interesting. It's something about bike car, and, um, and, and there's a theory going around, and it's, it's early days, mm -hmm. that um, hydrogen ion concentration inside the exercising muscle regulates uh, is involved in the regulation of mitochondrial mm. biogenesis and, and mitochondrial mm. function. So if you get high, high, high concentration lower while you're, while you're giving the muscle intense training, mm -hmm. mitochondria adapt better hmm. and therefore their, 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 their aerobic capacity is improved. Interesting. That's where some of this stuff is going on. It's not. Huh. It's not during the race. Mm -hmm. it's during the training. Interesting. Okay. Training adaptation. So, do you think that would be something potentially where one would use it, like you're saying, kind of like in their harder training block, and then taper off of it, and then bring it back up in that harder training block, but not necessarily like something they would use. In the week leading up to a race or something like that? Um, well, the answer to that question is no one knows, but I think theory, in theory, what you're saying is correct. Mm. It, it, it would be useful. It, it hmm. should be or could be useful mm -hmm. in, in those high training blocks mm -hmm. where you've got those in allow for greater out of time. Yeah. Uh, wow. Huh. And then I would that's imagine where that's, where, that's where the work's going now. Yeah. The other thing, you know. Put a caveat on it. These are um, studies which are, you know, um, probably not uh, highly trained elite athletes. This is, mm -hmm. this is in group lower than that, you know, trained mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So that adaptation, which, which people are seeing, and the scientists are saying, does it occur in the elite athlete? Mm -hmm. Right. And either. But, um, yeah. So there's a lot of we're now working, searching for what's the mechanism for this improvement. Mm -hmm. You know, is it seen across the board? That's mm -hmm. we, there will be a plethora of literature coming out in the next five years. I, I, I would suspect trying to yeah. unpack, unpack this. Yeah, and kind of taking that same note and school of thought, the one to three percent improvement that you mentioned from the sodium bicarb is that in the like professional level or is that in like recreationally active or trained or like what group do you recall that being in? Yeah, no, that's that, that, that kind of improvement is um, data which is coming from meta-analysis, which is coming from the broad range of studies. Gotcha, so there were okay. Data in there versus, but um, I would have thought in theory, it, 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 if it was done in elite athletes, mm -hmm. You might not get um, the three percent because mm -hmm. obviously they've got other adaptations going on. Right. Yeah. To, to, to acid-based um, regulation, mm -hmm. they still, still are likely to get a, a benefit and a bit of a lower the one percent. Yeah. Interesting. Very, very fascinating. So, talking about the endurance athletes and the sprint component and peak in bloodstream, is that or um sorry, is that the right term to say peak in bloodstream? bicarbonate concentration in the blood yeah. in the blood yeah. um but, is that something where say an athlete is doing an eight hour race is is that a situation where 
if they're trying to get that sprint home finish, is it unrealistic that they would utilize sodium bicarb prior to starting that event because the peak could have come and gone or? Yes, you raise an interesting point. So what is what is the time curve of, um, of the bicarbonate loading? And it is probably uh, by eight to 10 hours, you're back to basal. Mm, back to okay. Hmm. So an event like you know, eight hours and the sprint at the end, you mm-hmm. your, your bike goes back to where it was. Yes. So, okay. Which is another thing when you want, what an endurance athlete would have to think about mm-hmm. is when is going to be the, you know, like if it's a, if it's a two to three hour event, mm-hmm. you could actually, well, I don't know, you could bike up low mm-hmm. and then start straight away. Yeah. And the peak mm-hmm. will be there three hours later towards the, the end where your sprint is. Now, having said that, okay, there's a few other things going on there. No one's actually done a study to look at the what what happens to the bicarb curve mm. as a result of exercise. People mm. have taken the bicarb mm-hmm. and during rest have, have measured it and seen see what the curve is. With exercise, obviously, you know, the absorption of foods and all that stuff stuff is a little slower because there's less blood yes. under there. Yes. So the pharmacokinetic curve mm. of the bicarb could be different. And also removal of the, bi- of the bicarb from the body will be slightly different because you've got exercise going on. You've got right. blood flowing in different ways, um, et cetera. So no one's done the pharmacokinetic curve, how it's affected by exercise. Very interesting. So, and that, the, so sodium bicarb, the molecule, sodium and a bicarb, mm-hmm. does the sodium component, if, can someone count that towards their like sodium electrolyte content? Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's a lot, right? When you, when you take that high of a dose, um, from a, just yes. a sodium alone perspective, it's a significant amount, right? Yes, and some would argue, some would argue, and there's some good evidence for it, that the sodium actually is contributing to um, to the alkalosis, not just mm. the, not just the bicarbonate. Okay, so this takes us to your study um, where you were comparing the sodium citrate versus sodium bicarb, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And- so, okay, so then here in lies the, the issue. So sodium bicarb, everyone everyone thinks that it, you, know, you, you take the sodium bicarb and it's the bicarb which is adding to the bicarb concentration. Mm-hmm. Adding up and, and therefore you're getting an increased bicarb loading. That's, that's a simple, ex, simple explanation. It's probably not as simple as that, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. Sodium citrate also increases the bicarbonate concentration. Well, you're taking sodium and citrate, not bicarb. How, is, how on earth is sodium citrate causing an increase in bicarbonate concentration in the blood? Mm. Not bicarbonate. You're not taking bicarbonate. You're taking sodium mm-hmm. and citrate. Okay. And the supposed answer to that is um, the sodium citrate is ingested and goes into the bloodstream. You get sodium and citrate in there in equal, equal concentrations, you know, like. The citrate is metabolized, leaving sodium behind. Mm-hmm. Now, sodium has a is, a is a positive ion, and the body needs to be electronegative, mm-hmm. uh, electroneutral. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you have a, this increased positive charge inside the blood. Well, that's that can't happen. So there are mechanisms. One one of the mechanisms is for the kidney. To produce more bicarbonate, so it puts more mm. bicarbonate into the bloodstream and remove more hydrogen ions from, which is a positive charge mm-hmm. from from the blood. Huh. So this increased sodium ion concentration is causing the kidney to add so bicarbonate and remove hydrogen ions, and that's when you get the alkalosis. Fascinating. It's, it's by the, the, the sodium base. It's called what? What's it called? It, if you go and look at the literature, it's called the strong iron difference. Mm. And the body has to make sure that it has, it, it keeps 
the negative and positive charges um, neutral. Mm. And, it, and it, this difference between the sodium and bicarb triggers all this. And hydrogen ions is one of the things which is um, ex excluded because it, mm -hmm. it's a positive charge and it's easy to, to do things. And so eventually the sodium's removed, mm -hmm. but it takes a bit longer. Yeah. It takes longer to get, to get out of the system. So that's how it works. So um, it's the sodium has also a role. Yes. Like yeah. Fascinating. So um, I know we're, I want to be mindful of your time here. Um, do you, could you give us like a, a brief summary of that study results, the comparison? So when you did the comparison of how sodium citrate compared to sodium bicarb in terms of gastrointestinal symptoms, um, peaking in bloodstream, what was the outcome of that study there that you guys found? Summary is, um, we'll just go back a second. Sodium citrate, people have thought to use because they think it, it, it has um, less gastrointestinal mm, um, mm -hmm. effects. So, it, it, um, and it works similar ways, it, it, it causes alkalosis. Um, no, no study have actually looked at the optimum doses of and comparing sodium bicarb and sodium citrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the optimum dose for sodium bicarb, as I said, is 0.3 grams or 300 milligrams mm -hmm. per kilogram body weight, but the optimum dose for um, sodium citrate is 500 mm -hmm. milligrams or 0.5 of a gram. So they're bigger. Mm -hmm. When and when you use the optimum doses for both compounds and um, you know, take them using all the, the appropriate way of ingesting, et cetera. And we use gelatin capsules, not enteric capsules. So that's one mm. of the weaknesses of that study. But when you took gelatin capsules, in the end, when you took the two optimum doses, there was no difference. We mm. saw no difference in the, in the gastrointestinal symptoms between those two. Mm. If you take the same dose, 0.3 gram of sodium citrate, 0.3 gram of um, sodium bicarb, mm -hmm. Sodium citrate seems to have slightly less um, mm. gastrointestinal symptoms, but it, um, but that's not the optimum dose. So mm. the athlete will be taking the optimum dose, and when you take the different dose levels, but both of them are optimum, there's no difference in gastrointestinal. Interesting. Yeah, very neat. I love but, I love learning all this. <laughs> but the, the other take home is um, sodium citrate. Um, peaks later oh. and comes down slower. Mm. And sodium bicarb peaks earlier and comes down quickly. Mm. So you could, depending on your circumstances mm. you know, and the event and all those type of things, you could pick either one, mm. mm -hmm. depending on when you want the peak to peak. Interesting. So it's, it's about an hour slower. Mm -hmm. Sodium bicarb wow. slower than sodium bicarb. Mm. Okay. Uh, and the other thing to note, I think it's important to say, is the gastrointestinal symptoms peak before the peak of the alkalosis. Mm. <laughs> so you're better off delaying the exercise. Say, let's, say, let's take sodium bicarbonate. It peaks somewhere between 90 minutes to 180 minutes. Mm -hmm. so the gastrointestinal symptoms peak around about the 90 minutes. Oh. So if you wait a bit longer, you'll feel a bit better mm -hmm. if you've got any if you've got any symptoms and and you still haven't missed your peak at three hours. Right. That's good to know. So it's another way of trying to help um, get yeah. navigate it. That's smart. Yeah, hang around your your toilet for a little bit longer before you head out for your session. Yeah, correct. Well, if that's it, you know. So some people don't right don't have any symptoms at all. So there, there is a yeah. range. Yeah. And then well, there's another bit which you kind of um alluded to earlier. That the peak does vary, mm -hmm. but it also varies within the, the individual. Mm -hmm. The same individual can take the same dose from one day mm -hmm. to the next, and it, you know, whether that's measurement error, you know, whether it's measurement error or or something biological going on, but it can, it can vary by you know, hmm. or whatever it is. So, um, I, so I wouldn't get totally hung up on that. what's my actual peak. Yeah, there is, there is a range of time mm -hmm. where it should be up high enough to give you give you the effect and go with that. Yeah. 
Are there tools for like the general public to test their sodium bicarb levels like via finger prick or something like that? Or uh, not that I know of. No. Yeah. Okay. No. Some Silicon Valley business is about to invent that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, these are blood gas machines in there. Uh, a few thousands of dollars, uh, you know, 10, 15 thousand of dollars. So, right. Uh, uh, but it, it is basically, you can do it on a finger prick. Yeah. Wow. It's a fairly, it's a fairly sophisticated um, mm-hmm. Hospitals wow. have a sleeve and sports on that. Yeah. yeah. Very neat. One, I'm sure they'll be out there one day if, if we keep seeing <laughs> well, benefits yeah. from the. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. The technology Very interesting. Um, okay. Well, I want to be mindful of your time here since we're getting close on the hour. And um, so I'll circle back to your two truths and a lie. Uh, do you want to repeat those for us one more time? Uh, yeah. I walked a, th- a thousand kilometers in. Um, I did a walk of a thousand kilometers. My golf handicap's 11. And I um, worked as a visiting scientist in Canada. All right. So Amanda said the visiting scientist in Canada was a lie. I think the golf thing is a lie. Which one was the lie? Yeah, the golf handicap, sadly. Oh. <laughs> My no knowledge of golf just <laughs> helped me I'm out. I'm trying there. to get it to 11. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. Next time we um, talk to you, maybe it'll be 11. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Goodness. Uh, well, I don't think I'll ever get to 11. It's about 30. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, tell us about your um, a thousand kilometer walk. Was that, tell yeah, us about it. A, yeah, we did a thousand kilometer walk in, um, in Spain, the Camino to Santiago. So with my wife oh, in 2015. Oh. So we walked from the, the French Spanish border all the way along the Bay of Biscay, all the way along across to the awesome. Atlantic coast. Yeah, it was wonderful, great, great fun. Yeah. How long did that take you? It took the seven weeks. Oh my goodness. A bit slack. Some people do it in about 30 days, 35 days. We're at the top. Yeah, you were enjoying yourself, t- checking out the, the scenery. That's amazing. Wow, good for you. Um, okay, so where can people find you, check you out, follow your research? Where should we link in the show oh, notes? Yeah. Okay, where can you find me? Um, where can you find me? I don't know, you just, you'd probably used to do Google. Google, Rockstar. LinkedIn, PubMed. Yeah, LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm not that great at. PubMed, yeah, you can get it. <laughs> you'll, you'll search. All the, all the uh, scientific search engines. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other, the other ways you know, through my email address if people want to catch up which you guys have, so if you want to let that that's fine too yeah that awesome be, yeah. all right yeah, well we will link the articles we talked about today in the show notes for the listeners um and thank you so much for joining us this has been a fascinating episode i'm very excited about sharing no this problem. on with our listeners hopefully they geek out on as much as i i did this was really really neat so i appreciate um your time here today rod thank you yeah, but any other time, more than happy to as well. Thank you. Amazing.